Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, I'm Padma Shri Warrior. I am the founder and CEO of Fable. Uh, welcome to all of the members or Lev Arberton's book club on Fable who are joining us today. Um, I was thrilled to watch this book club grow. Levar in the last year, uh, the membership continues to grow and people are amazingly engaged with so many insightful, detailed comments about all of the books that we are reading together. Um, so special welcome to all of you. And uh, for those of you that are joining us for the first time, this is the second virtual event we are doing for uh, members of the Lev Arberton Book Club, actually, and, and anyone who wants to join. The event is open to everyone. If you are not already a member, we hope you become a member of Lev Arts Club. It's really simple. You just go to www.fable.co backslash Levar. Uh, so as you all know, Levar has dedicated his life to bringing the power of storytelling to people of all ages. We feel very lucky to have him as he has been sharing his book recommendations and actually been reading with all of us with great literary insights as we read together with him in the book club on Fable. From Roots to Reading Rainbow to Star Trek Next Generation, Levar has been captivating all of us around the world for what, I don't know, more than 40 years with his authentic charm and passion for storytelling. He's an accomplished producer, director, podcaster, and now book club moderator. Um, we are currently reading Noor, a brand new science fiction novel written by our guest today, the Nigerian American novelist, Nnedi Okarafor. Nnedi holds a PhD in literature, as well as a master's degree in journalism and literature. She's the winner of Hugo Nebula World Fantasy Locus Lodestar Awards, and her works include Who Fears Death, which is in development at HBO into a TV series. We can't wait to see that. The Binti Novella Trilogy, also in development. The Book of Phoenix, the Akata Books, and Lagoon. Nnedi has also written comics for Marvel, including Black Panther, Long Live the King, and Wakanda Forever. She's also co-writing the adaptation of Octavia Butler's Wild Seed. Octavia Butler, by the way, is another favorite author on Fable, and we read one of her books uh, with Levar as well. So now I will turn over the conversation to Levar and Nnedi. Welcome to both of you. Um, I will turn my video off and you will continue the conversation. I, I'm sure I won't be able to add any value to the two of you talking. And uh, when the session is about to conclude, I'll join back um, and wrap up. Um, so with that, uh, over to you, Levar and Neri. Thank you so much, Padma Sri. Um, welcome, Neri Okorofor. We are not strangers to each other, full disclosure. Um, we've, we've, we've met and um, are members of a mutual admiration society, fair to say? Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I am a huge fan. You are one of my favorite authors breathing, and for, for many reasons, some of which um, I, I hope to cover this evening. But I think one of the things that stands out for you, at least in my mind, as a writer and as a human being is the sense that I get from you, it's like, and I, I, I don't know, have we had this conversation before? If I was ever in a position where I could recommend someone to be on a team for first contact, right? <laughs> contact with, a, with another civilization, you <laughs> would be my nominee, right? I love it. <laughs> because, because A, your imagination is boundless and you demonstrate that every time you write. And it also seems to me that you have a real genuine appreciation for life forms here on this planet that um, most people would find um, unusual, if not off-putting. Your compassion extends to all creatures, I think maybe even particularly to those whom are shunned by the nature of of their character, their name, their makeup. Yeah. Is there any truth in that assessment? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, um, I, I love bugs, for example. You do. I have, and, and it's like, it's like, uh, it's something that has been a part of me since I can even remember. Like, it's not something that I learned. It's mm -hmm. something that has been a part of me. There is something about like, um, like the insect world in particular. Like I've always loved animals. Like uh, from, mm -hmm. from the moment like that I can even remember th that my memory starts. I've always just loved like non-human creatures. But there is something about insects. I think it's just they're, they're so much themselves and there's such a diversity of them and they're so different from us. And everything that they do is the way they do it. And by their own, like everything is their own. So it's, um, mm -hmm. and I've always been, I've just, I just have always loved that. I've always loved that and, and been fascinated by it and, and been attracted to it. And, and I just love the idea of loving that without any expectation, you know? So that's, that's something that's always been a part of me. Mm. To love without the expectation of anything in return. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's no, the, nothing that's reciprocated, most, just, yeah. That's the most rare kind of love, isn't it? It's a, I mean, is it? I, 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 I guess. think so, yes. Hmm. Uh, for human beings, we, we rarely see love outside of a transactional dynamic. True, <laughs> true, it's true, without just, expecting something and, you know, something in return to balance it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah I'll it, agree it, with that. It doesn't come naturally to us as it, as it does to you. So I, I think that alone, but, you know, just one of many reasons why you would be my choice to be a part <laughs> of a first contact team, because they can't all be scientists. Uh, you know, they, 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 some, they, there has to be a writer, there has to be a humanist in there somewhere, somebody to represent what's best about us because we tend to forget what's the best about us whenever we're engaging with something new or foreign or unfamiliar. I agree. And like, also we tend to get preoccupied with our goals as well. You know, right. like what, what do we want from this thing? And what do we fear about this thing? Like all of that. And I think that um, creatives, we bring a little, we, we bring something else. Uh, you know, we, we bring a, a different way of thinking, a different way of approaching and not so focused, <laughs> you know, on the agenda. So, yeah, yeah. It's right. just like a, yeah. Um, in, a, in a lot of ways, you know, some of us will have an appreciation for those things that and the, the agenda won't be concerned with. And those may be may turn out to be the things that, you know, the point of view that we need along that with makes the agenda. The difference, yeah. Right. That yeah. makes the difference. Absolutely. Well, let's talk a little bit about A.O. because she certainly is a character that um, is unconventional and has a, a, a journey of acceptance from those outside of herself and self-acceptance as a part mm -hmm. of the journey that, that she's on. Was there an inspiration um, for, for A.O. Or, or how did she come about in, in, in your imagination? Um, A.O. is, so A.O. is a woman who has um, she was born with a lot, she was born with several disabilities, like severe disabilities from the beginning. And, um, and she's born into this, this Nigerian family that has specific cultural ways and ideologies, right? And uh, she, as, as she grows older, she has, and just to survive, just to survive, she has to have all of these, um, these cybernetic parts, you know, she has, uh, um, for lack of a better, it's very complicated to explain it, but cybernetic um, intestines, lungs, um, her le both of her limbs, one of her arms, she has neural implants, all of these things. And these are all mostly for survival, you know, for mm -hmm. her to be able to move around in the world, you know, with comfort and confidence. And so a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the alter alterations that she makes are very much, um, there's a decision that she has to make in them. You know, there's a decision and it's very, it, it's like, it cuts to the core of humanity. Like, okay, I was born with this thing. I was born with these legs. Do I get rid of these legs that I was born with that are mine or do I just replace them? You know, like, so, so she has to make these decisions and she decides to replace 
you know, she's like, okay, if it's not working, I'm like, you know, uh, a car where if it's not working, I'll replace it with something that allows me to move through the world properly. So right. um, where did I come up with this? It's a lot of it is very personal. A lot mm -hmm. of it is very personal. And these are things that I've thought about. Um, there's right. some wish fulfillment happening in this as well. But like, you know, because I've gone through a lot of, you know, physical issues, like, because I have my own disabilities, um, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to summarize it really quickly. Um, I was an athlete, and then I had scoliosis and then had to, uh, and that scoliosis was really, really severe, which led to me having this spinal surgery, routine spinal surgery. There was a, there were some complications woke up paralyzed when I was 19, you know, so I went from being a mega athlete to not being able to walk and then having to learn how to walk. And, and that's how, that was really how I became a writer, but like, that's a really bad summary of all of that. But to, but to kind of get to the point when I was writing Ao, who makes all of these altercations to her, um, all like these, these changes to her body. Mm -hmm. These are, these are things that I've thought a lot about, you know, um, where I went from being a mega athlete to literally overnight being in a, not even, not even a wheelchair, not being not able to even roll over, like in a hospital bed, half of my body disappeared. I can see it, but it's like disappeared. Um, and having to like learn, learn, relearn how to walk and never getting the, the, that athletic ease back. And then, you know, so I, I often think like, well, I'm waiting for the technology where I can just like, where I can have like some exoskeletons on my legs and move and be able to move with, with that ease that I remember. And so like in the future, we have this character who can do that and she chooses to do that. And she goes against her, her parents' wishes and like their ideologies because she's like, this is my life. I wanna move around the, I wanna move around this world in the way that I want to move and I wanna do it well. And so she makes these decisions. So like these are a, a lot of a lot of her character were like, it's not that she's me. It, it's that there are conversations that she's had that she has that I've had before. And she may make some different decisions, gutsier, you know, more aggressive decisions. But that's really where her character, uh, the the foundation of her character comes from, from some aspect of of your your own past. Yes. Yes. Make, make perfect sense to me. It, one of the things that I love about the LeVar Burton Book Club here on Fable is that the, 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 the members of the book club are really insightful and engaged, and they love reading Noor. Um, I want to share a couple of their questions with you, but before I do, can we just spend a moment? We'll, we'll come back to that. I want to come back to, after we talk about the book a little bit more, I want to come back and talk about African futurism and African Jujuism. Sure. Um, if, if you're willing, because it is a, a, it's a subject that has um, uh, limitless fascination for me and uh, up to and including the, <laughs> the ways that, that people in American culture have managed to get it twisted. Yes. <laughs> yep. So, so I, I'd, I'd like to spend a little time on that. But here first is a, is a question about Ao and, and her physicality. There's a quote, I don't believe in the traditional aesthetics of beauty. Mm -hmm. Not for me. For me, it's not in the look. It's not in the function. But it's in the, it is. It's in the function, the kinetics, the motion, the fluidity of moving in space and time. My body could never be beautiful by traditional human aesthetics. And so the question is, how do you think that our aesthetics of beauty will continue to evolve as technology progresses? And do you believe that they will in fact have to embrace the idea of, of, of body modification um, and, and cybernetic extensions of who we are as physical beings? Yeah, um, there are two sides to that. There's the side of where, where alter, alterations are made for the sake of um, getting closer to um, that impossible beauty. Mm. You know, so, there, so there's that. And then yeah. there's also where alterations are made to live a, a fulfilling life where it's not <laughs> based on the beauty myth. So it's like, uh, so like to answer that question, I think that in the, I, I think that in the future, it's going to be like, 
there's going to be an evolution and a what's the opposite uh, de evolution? A evolution, <laughs> yeah, a, a dismantling and unraveling. Yeah, I, I think that uh, because you're going to have those th that ability to to literally get closer to those beauty that beauty myth. So it's like you know, be it virtually because we already see it where people don't put their profile picture, they'll put like a, an avatar that looks like a cartoon version of them, which is basically a cleaned up. It doesn't have all like all the flaws and all that. So it's like, and then even the filters, the, the filters that like a lot of young people are very mm -hmm. used to using now, mm -hmm. and they're used to seeing themselves through a filter. And so like, so that, that's, in my opinion, that's the de-evolution because, you, you know, you got to, you're not facing the reality. So there's that. And then mm -hmm. there's the other side of it where there are all these possibilities where, um, you know, people with, with disabilities or people who want to do something that they couldn't do before are, are, are suddenly able to do it, but that might look strange, you know, and, and then people getting used to that strange. You know, so 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 that would be the evolution, I believe. Yeah. You know, so it's yeah. going to be a, a little bit of both. And and I will say that that whole ideology with with where where Ao is thinking that that's another personal thing for me because for me growing up, um, having scoliosis, having a spine that's in an S shape, it meant that I could never be in any norm. Like I could wow. never. And so at one point, like at a very young age, like maybe around sixteen, because my scoliosis was really it was it was it was pretty severe and there was it was like that's the way i was growing there was nothing that i could mm. do about it and so um i'd made a decision at that young age it was like okay i'm not going to try to aspire to any of these standards of beauty because i never can i n literally never can i i am i am by definition outside of those standards of beauty. I can't I can't sit up straight. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. My spine is in an S. So this is my, I'm I'm shifting my way of viewing things and I'm not aspiring to that because to aspire to that impossible standard is a road to darkness cuz I could never achieve it. It's not me. It will never be me. So like that was so that was where that came from with AO cuz it's it's hers is like a whole like it whole evolved, um, like her her way of looking at beauty and that that aesthetic beauty is very evolved. It's it's yeah. like what I went through, what like where my standards were to like times a thousand. She's just like um, she's been she's forced to so expand far. her idea of what beautiful is. Yes, right? to yeah. include herself. I think it's a journey yes. that Annie that 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 people of color know really really yep. really well very mm -hmm. familiar with that journey of having to expand what our idea of mm -hmm. beauty is in spite of the popular norms mm -hmm. that have been established culturally to, I, to identify ourselves in, within that realm of things that are beautiful. Yes. Um, it is a, it's, it's a real common journey for, for a lot of us people of color. Um, it, it, it's very, very much alive and prevalent in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a really, uh, fascinating character uh, to me. Um, let me see, there's a, another question. <laughs> Here's one that I love because it, it, it talks about the podcast um, that she listens to. And the quote is, I saved the podcast right on my phone, ready to play on the home screen. <laughs> I played it once and it soothed me. I played it again and I felt hope. I began to imagine and wonder. The red line was still there, but it became a tent. I listened to that podcast over and over for months, for years. So the question that the reader has is, AO takes solace in a podcast during a difficult time in her life. Do you have a podcast, a book, or any other media that you might turn to for hope? Oh, yeah. There are, mm -hmm. like, one of the... One of the so like the I have I have a few podcasts that you know um, that kind of and they're they're pretty popular you know that kind of got me through the uh, the pandemic for example mm -hmm. yeah lockdown Trevor Noah's podcast definitely got me through yeah. like it it allowed me to laugh at the things that were happening 
and I needed that. And I, I didn't listen to a lot of podcasts until lockdown, you know, so that was where I really got into um, Trevor Noah's podcast. I, I listened to Rachel Maddow's podcast, but then sometimes I get so angry that I can't listen. I can't, it's not as comforting as it should be, but it's good information. Um, I discovered Russell Brand's podcast. He has a, some very interesting, uh, interesting point of view that I don't always agree with, but I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, He's been really Lavar surprisingly and, thoughtful and, yeah. and deep. Russell, yeah, and Russell. very deep. He, he is. Yeah. He, I, I, yeah, I, I never sensed that from him in his previous lifetime in this yeah. body, but I'm really, I've, I've, I check in now and again, and I, mm -hmm. he talks about some stuff that's absolutely relevant and germane to the human experience. Yeah. Um, from a spiritual perspective, uh, I think he's got a lot to say. Exactly. Especially that yeah. spiritual perspective. He's like gone yeah. really, um, like there have been moments that have brought me to tears listening, mm -hmm. to, listening to him that mm -hmm. are very unexpected. Um, mm -hmm. And then, of course, I listen to LeVar Burton Reads. Um, and, and this is something I also want to say, like, because the, like there are certain stories on you know LeVar Burton Reads that I listen to over and over again just because um, but also there is a, a sleep story that you did for the Calm app mm -hmm. and I, I think I've told you this before and I just need to say that I still the, the sleep story that you did for the Calm app I listened to it and my daughter knows it well I listen to it like three nights a week, at least over and over. It's like, cause it's about space. It takes you out yeah. in space to all the planets and it just, the way it moves. And I will say that that, um, I forgot what it's called, beyond something like Earth. Beyond, beyond the stars. Beyond the stars, that was it. Mm -hmm. um, that effect, when I was writing Nor, the, the, the feeling, yeah, the feeling that I had when listening to that, was I it definitely transferred to how I talked about the podcast definitely and her listening to it over and over and over and over yeah that is 100% true that like I listen to that a lot and it has it's got a it's definitely got a feel it's definitely got a feel that stays with me <laughs> all right y'all oh <laughs> I'm I've, I've all of a sudden got a, a, an attack of the vapors <laughs> um, and and uh, have had <laughs> just, give me a, just just a, one one moment. I love it so much. I really do. It's wow, one of my favorite. Okay, games. well, <laughs> you, you can't talk to me anymore. None of y'all. Uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm Let's go to another question. Okay, shall we? To replace an organ or two with cybernetic 3D printed non-human parts was fine. People needed pacemakers, new limbs, skin grafts, etc. But if you were one of those people who seemed to be more machine than human for whatever reason, one of those who refused to obey the laws of nature and die, you were a demon. Mm -hmm. So the question, what kind of a woman are you, is a question that haunts Ao in the novel. Do you think that we will see this kind of prejudice in the future, prejudice against those who are extra human or, um, yeah, ex ex extra human? I, oh, I guess yeah. it's as good a way to put it as in. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I, I, I strongly believe we'll see that kind of um, discrimination in that why don't you just die attitude. Yeah. Like, because I think that people will see um, people like AO, even even lesser versions of her, and mm -hmm. and they'll have to confront themselves, yeah. you know, and, and and then like they'll just have all of these in confronting themselves, they'll they, they'll they'll have like these conflicts and they'll feel all these conflicts and those conflicts will be and those questions will be uncomfortable, yeah. and that will translate to that discrimination that you'll see. I, I definitely believe that. And, and, I, and you know, I, I think that in, when it comes to any kind of discrimination, we're definitely going to see them in the future if we don't handle them now, yeah. if we don't address them now. Things don't just stop because it's the future, you know, <laughs> or because time passes. Things right. stop because they are addressed and grappled with and fought through and worked through and then healed. So if right. those things don't happen, yes. It can be a hundred years from now, and we're still going to see that kind of thing in the future. And you know, when it comes to people doing 
the, just uh, people finding ways to live their lives because they're born in a different type of way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, those things make people question themselves. And, and, and that's like uncomfortable and people don't want to question themselves. So, so yeah, I, I, I strongly believe we will see that kind of discrimination in the future. Unfortunately, I, I, I agree. I think you're absolutely right. We don't have such a great track record, uh, yeah. do we? With right. uh, acknowledging and, and, um, and, and um, finding space for the differences that already exist yep. in, in people um, across this, this globe. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, African futurism and 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 what it means to you, um, as opposed to the and I don't mean to put a label on you, but mm -hmm. I have seen in print authors refer to your work as Afrofuturism, which it mm -hmm. is not, and mm -hmm. there is a difference. Would you mind elucidating? For me? Yeah, yeah. It's um. Uh, first, I want to preface with. I don't like labels. <laughs> I, I don't, they're not something that I enjoy talking about. They're not something that I enjoy slapping on myself. Um, they, none of them ever fit fully. They slip around and I'm very, very slippery. I'm very, very slippery. And I, I will like do something completely different in a heartbeat because that's me. I, I, I feel like as an, as a creative, I can do, I can and will do whatever I want. And I, and I don't like staying, and I don't, I don't just stay some, it, within something just because I'm known for it or because it's successful or whatever, it's, it's from within. So that's, mm -hmm. that's I wanna preface with that. So um, the whole conversation about Afrofuturism and African futurism kind of came up when I just noticed, um, I noticed several things and they're all very, they're like hot button issues and, and, uh, and, people get really upset because people are hurt and everyone's trying to get, find their space, uh, make their space and have their stories told. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but I just kind of noticed that with, <laughs> okay. So with Afrofuturism, there was a centering of the United States and the yeah. West, the narratives of the United States and the West. And I, I noticed this and I was fine with it, but like I, I, initially I tried to embrace the term. I tried to make it mine um, as well and be included in the term. And, and when I did that, it didn't fit. It didn't fit because it didn't fit. Like, you know, it was, so I, I realized that, okay, I'm gonna have to kind of, it wasn't that I, I felt that I needed to coin a new term, which is what I did, I, you know, I coined a new term. Mm -hmm. Um, African futurism, but like what I, but what I wanted to do, my intent with the term is to open it up. I want to mm. open it up. I want there to be a con I want there to be an understanding and a conversation about the diversity within black speculative fiction writing. I wanted yes! that to happen. Yeah. That was, was just really important to me. Thank you <laughs> for that because it's, it, because it's important. It's important to me that we recognize that just like the journey that we have been on with expanding the idea of what science fiction or speculative fiction literature looks like in this country, in this culture, we also have to acknowledge that that is a very narrow lens through which we are looking at a very big idea, right? Through the, through the lens of a white man, which is yeah. where most of this material was sourced for since the inception of the genre. Yeah, um, and 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 it was necessary that that idea of the source, the inspiration for story, had to expand because representation matters. And yes. and so here you come along, and by no fault of your own, you found a need to expand the term, the nomenclature, in order to more fit what it is you do. And you've been really vocal and really insistent about it. And I have been cheering you on from the sidelines from jump because you do not play Nettie Okora. <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 you have very little patience for ignorance and stupidity and you don't condone it or engage with it. You, you, you are a warrior woman 
And that's one of the things that I most admire and enjoy about you is your insistence on people, at least they're going to know what you think and how you feel, whether they embrace those aspects of you or not, you're going to let us know who you are and what you think and how you feel. And that's, um, there is no bigger responsibility for an artist than to be on that vibe, how we're feeling, what we're thinking, how we're behaving, right? That's the realm in, in which we dwell as artists. And yeah. I'm just, I'm such a huge fan for, for the way you take care of yourself in the public space. Um, <laughs> seriously. Uh, it, 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 it is uh, both admirable and infinitely entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I can't help it. It's just me. I like, I have a thing where I don't like to be misunderstood or like where I say something and it's just uh, taken in the wrong way. It, it's, it's like a deep, it deeply irks me because I'm very like, uh, I'm very clear. I typically am very clear and I just, when someone comes along and takes, I say something and takes what I say and then flips it in this way that's very subtle, but it's still different. And then, and then that change kind of reverberates and becomes something else. And it's just, ah, everything that I've been trying to say becomes this other thing. I find it very frustrating. And I know I don't have full control over uh, what people think, but I do have control over what I say in my words, like the words that come out of my mouth. Yeah. So just. And you use your words exactly <laughs> well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I love, I love your engagement with folks on Twitter. I really do. Um, I, I, I really love the way you handle yourself because you're, you're you unashamedly, unabashedly, always. Yes. Always you. <laughs> Can we talk about um, some of the other projects that you're involved in? Because you are, as, as my mother would have said, busier than a one-legged woman in yeah. an ass-kicking contest, right? Yeah. You've got <laughs> so much going on in your life uh, these days. Can we talk a, a little bit about the status of some of the projects that you're engaged in? Yeah. Um... Boy, it's funny because I almost have to like write down my projects because there are so many of them and they're all important. Mm-hmm. And they're all active. They're all moving. And it's, um, but yeah, okay. So I can imagine I, I, you've got like this huge whiteboard somewhere in your office and mm-hmm. you've just got like all of these projects and their status and you're tracking and it's just like full. It's yeah. like there's hardly any room to write anything else on that yeah. whiteboard it, it, in my imagination. I have that whiteboard and it gets cluttered <laughs> and I have to keep, it's cluttered because I have to keep adding to it and erasing and moving things around. It's because I need it there to, to remember, like I remember all of them, but it's, it's to, I have to remember all of them at the same time, which is a different, it's a different feat. Um, in, in, any, in the course of any given day, how many of these projects do you work on? I mean, how, how, what is your process <sighs> like? Because you, like you've got, my mother, again, as Irma Jean would have said, you have so many irons in the fire. How do you keep them all going? How do you keep them hot, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, was like, the <laughs> I do it. I just do it. It's like, I just do it. Um, one of the things that comes with writing a lot of novels is that your memory is really strong. Because in order to write a novel, you have to hold the entire universe, story, character, all of that of the novel in your mind at once. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a hard, like, a, it's a hard thing. I can't do it for long. And that's why I write my novels quickly and finish them. Like beginning, um, well, I don't write linearly, but like I, I, fin- I finish them quickly and then I go and edit them because holding it like that is, is a great strain. So that's kind of where, I, that's a that's a skill that I've learned when it comes to juggling all of my projects, holding everything mm-hmm. together, and knowing and then knowing which is urgent, which what I need to do. And and I, I I will say on a practical level, I'll wake up the first thing I do when I like I open my eyes in my bed and think, what do I have to do today? And then I'll go through it all, and then something will hi- something will burn brightest, and I know that's the one that I have to address. 
And so like more and more, I, when I first started out, it was just one novel, you know, where I would just write a novel, like I'd work on the novel and that would be it. Like, it was crazy. I remember those days, like, that's not it anymore. <laughs> Cause like now I've got, um, so we've got, you know, yeah, Who Fears Death is in development at HBO. Ooh. That one I'm a consultant on. And so like, I'm not actively writing with that one, um, right. but I'm seeing all of the, the progressions and the, the whatever. Drafts I'm, and iterations. Yeah, the draft, yes. All the moves that are being made. Yes. And so that one is, that one's on the move. That's what I, I will say. That one is on the move. And then, um, and then there's Binti. And mm -hmm. Binti is Binti is active as well. See, I can't say much because it's like we're just. Oh, but that's why I'm I, within the confines of what you yeah. can share. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asking for you know something okay. to get you in trouble with the NDA. Yep. Uh, that you signed. <laughs> I just you know just give so us, much. Give us what you can. Okay, so so Binti like Binti is on the move as well, and okay. we have a director for Binti you do. for the pilot. Okay. So we'll say that. Can't tell us who it is can't yet and oh okay. when okay. I can, okay. I'll, be so okay. okay. I'll be so happy I'll be so happy when I can um so th so that's been is going to be a uh is it a, a, a mini series um, tv series yeah it's a tv it's a tv series yes and where will we be able to find binti when, um when it comes out? that's that's another one that I can't because okay. it was it was okay. with Hulu but it's not with Hulu anymore so okay. that's what I'll say um okay good okay yeah right. yeah so so there's that Okay. And then, uh, and then there's Wild Seed as well. Okay, what can I say about Wild Seed? What can you tell us about Wild Seed, Nettie? Yeah. Um, we okay. So we 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 we've written the pilot, okay. and we're working on the we're working on episode two, okay. and um, that's really all I could say. Okay. <laughs> there's right. like there's it's it's. Uh, it hasn't Wild gone before the cameras yet. No, not yet. Wild Seed is a tough nut to crack. Wild Seed is a tough nut to crack. I will say that. Reason, um, well, there, there are a couple of reasons why Octavia hasn't been brought to the screen yes. yet. Yes. Um, the but being being the nut that it is, it is not easy. It yeah. is not easy. Yeah, um, Wild Seed but is that's one of the reasons why I was so ecstatic when I heard your name associated with the project. I thought, yeah. okay. But yeah. at least we know it's gonna be done right. Yes, um, it is. It's it's just um it's a it's work. Um, yeah. you know, adapting wild seed is work. It's a, it's, it's, you know, it's about African immortals, which means yeah. time period, like over yeah. time. And you have to look at that, you know, so, um, yeah, so we're, we're, we're working on that. I'm, I'm co-writing and, and co-creating that with Winarika Hiu. We work together on a lot of things. Um, I will say there are things happening with and I can't say more, there are things happening with remote control, my novella, remote control. Yeah, there are things happening with that. And there are things happening with the Incibiti script series. That one, really? yeah, like amazing things. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah. I can't wait till I can share share more on those. So, so yeah, and uh, I can't say anything about that one. I'm gonna just stay. There's one more. I'll just stay completely quiet about that for now. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. But see, Fair all enough. the juggling with all these these adaptations, it's like it's a lot of um, it's exciting, and it's like these are world like like the Binti's world. I love mm -hmm. Binti's world. I just love existing in it. And so like when you're adapting it, it just opens up that much more and you get to see yeah. all these sides of character. It's, it's, it's really enjoyable. It's really enjoyable. So it's work, but it's really enjoyable. I know that I speak for many uh, and, and many on this call that cannot wait to see your work on screens, both large and small in the not too distant future in our lives. You are and continue to be one of the most important writers in my world. Um, living or dead, um, your work has had a tremendous impact on me in my life and helped me see more of the, the breadth of who I am um, as a human being. And I love seeing myself, my hopes, my aspirations, my dreams reflected in your work, Nadia wow. Corfor. You truly are a visionary of the highest order. And I'm a huge fan. Thank and so that will never change, <laughs> ever, ever, ever.
Wow. 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 It's that's let's bring Padma Sri Warrior uh, back to the conversation to to wrap us up and, and, and send us on our way. Padma Sri, nice to have Nettie in the house. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much, both of you. What an inspirational conversation. And and Nettie, thank you so much for, for sharing your own personal journey. That just makes reading the books and everything so much more intimate and special for us in the club. Appreciate that. Okay. Um, there are, by the way, a couple of great questions. Um, maybe since we have one more minute, if I can yes. ask one of those. Uh, one question is from Kirsten. And the question is, is your process different for different formats, uh, novels, comics, and adaptation? Um, and going along with that, do you decide who your audience is going to be before you start a story mm -hmm. or after? Okay, um, I'll try to be quick. Um, I'll start with the second one when it comes to audience, definitely after. I don't think about, I just write the thing and I don't even know who's going to read it or, or where it's going. Or like half the time, I don't even know if it's adult or young adult or whatever. So I just, I just write it and then whoever likes it, likes it. That's yeah. Um, in terms of process, yeah, the process for comics is very different from not like novel writing. My my novel writing process and it, even my short story writing process is very chaotic. It's very um, I don't outline. I just start and I don't and I write in a very nonlinear way where I can write the the ending first or the middle first and then ju I just jump around and then eventually put it all together and then edit that. And that's how I write. So it's very, it's very chaotic and spontaneous and, and subconscious. So that's very different from comics, where comics, you go in knowing how long it's going to be. You have to write a summary for that issue. You know, so you, you go in knowing how long it's going to be, what it's about, like what all of the, what the arc of the story is, all of that. So that's a completely different type of writing, um, which I find enjoyable because it forced me to do something other than, like it forced me to write in a way that is, does not come naturally to me. And, you know, it's a good lesson. It's a good lesson, it's a good exercise. It, it, I find it very fulfilling. And then film adaptation, and then also comics is very collaborative as well. You've got the illustrators and all that. And, and that's the same thing with fil like, uh, film and TV adaptation. There's a, lot, there's a lot more going on than the lone process of novel writing, which I, I, lo I love it all. It's really exciting. Right. Not everybody can bounce back and forth though between yeah. genres the way the way you seem to have developed a real adeptness at doing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a weird, I, I don't, it's like, I think a lot of it has to do with I love I love learning, you know, and that was something I learned during my PhD. Like one of the biggest things that I came away with with from, from that whole process was a love for learning new things. And like novel writing, I'll always have, that's mine. And so I can do this other thing where I'm not the, the, the goddess of that world. I can do this other thing where I can work with other people and, and um, we can like grow something together because I always have novel writing. I can always go back to that because that's mine. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. We want you to be the goddess of everything. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, I want to be respectful of both your times. Thank you both for taking uh, the time to talk with all of the members who are in the club and who are wanting to hopefully join and continue to read with you, Lavar, and, and uh, read your books, Nidhi. We look forward to all of the exciting projects that you could not talk about. We can't wait. We'll be watching the news to hear more and learn more. Um, thanks to everyone who joined. We will have the recording available later for those of you that could not or want to watch it again because there's just so many insights. Uh, we'll also be publishing the transcript of uh, what Lavar and uh, Nidhi talked about today. Um, and just remind your friends to join the club. It's very simple, fable.co backslash Levar. And uh, thank you both uh, for being here with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Padma Sri. Nettie, thank you so much for just being you. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's always good to talk here. Energy is always so positive and healing. So thank you. God bless. Peace God and bless. blessings, everybody. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time. But you don't have to take our word for it. <laughs> <laughs> bye. Bye-bye, y'all. Right, take care, everyone. <laughs>